and welcome to the Northlake College Video and Film Professional Forum. I'm your host, June Owens, and today we're joined by Grace Kim, Tom Post, David Koss, and Bill Britton. We will first start with Tom Post, and he'll tell us a little bit about his background. Uh, graduated from here in 03. Uh, I've been in the business pretty much ever since. Um, do a lot of freelance work, and I also own my own small production company, and we do a lot of travel and things of the sort. Okay, let's go to Grace. Uh, I graduated 2007. I from think. North Lake College. Yeah, from North Lake College. And then I took an internship at AMS while I was attending um, North Lake, and that led into a full time staff as an editor, video editor. So, and I've worked on a um, variety of th things there, like corporate videos and documentaries, and mainly uh, broadcasting series and pilots and specials and all sorts. <laughs> Great. Let's go to David Koss. I um, started here in 99 and kind of went on the road for a while and came back. I had to finish the degree. So I think 2009 is when I officially graduated here. Um, and um, I was on the road for quite a while. Uh, I was doing concert touring and then um, ended up uh, getting a directing gig uh, with George Strait and did that for a while. And once I had Got married, had kids settled down. I got a job here in in uh, Dallas. I'm senior editor at a uh, production company, and I own a motion graphics company and run a tutorial site. So, staying pretty busy. That's great. And Bill Britton. So, Gina, you're saving the oldest for last. Is that right? <laughs> okay, that's that's fine. That's perfectly acceptable. So. Um, so I graduated from uh, North Lake uh, back in 93, don't hold that against me, it was many moons ago. Um, went on to, uh, did an internship with Radio Shack, back then it was the Radio Shack Broadcast uh, Department. Uh, later on we grew that into a three studio kind of a thing. We spun off into CRM Productions, which is now in Las Colinas. They do a lot of Dave Beck's, uh, Glenn Beck I should say, uh, a lot of his production over there. Uh, from there I moved over to a little company called Dillard's. And so we are part of the leadership team. Uh, we do a lot of uh, video production and uh, training and development as well, so. Okay, I'd like to start with, um, what do students need to know while they're in college to prepare for the real world? Let's start with Grace. Hmm, why don't we start with Tom? Let me think about <laughs> okay. it. Okay, let's start with Tom again. Yeah. Um, what do they need to know to prepare for the real world? Well, a demo reel or oh, yeah, you know, that definitely. internship. I would say that the one thing is it's, it's completely different from any other industry going out there. Like I, I sort of had the viewpoint coming out of college that, okay, I have some schooling. This is what I might, you know, this will help get my foot in the door when in reality um, people tend not to look at that too much. It's more about what you've done, your experience coming into the business. I've seen People with four-year degrees from NYU or, you know, film colleges in L.A. that can't even get a job getting coffee for people just because of the wrong attitude or the, uh, the wrong viewpoint on how the industry works. It's very much who you know and what you know and not your credentials on paper, in my experience. And Grace has a great story about AMS how she got this job, Andy, her boss, tells me this all the time. Why don't you tell the students how? Well, I was interning at AMS, so, and I was post-intern, so I was mainly shadowing the senior editors and, you know, their editing and what they're doing and just kind of trying to learn behind. And I was, you know, one day I was just in the edit bay with the senior editor, and Andy just dropped by and just, spots me and like oh so what are you good at because he I'm, I'm sure he just you know goes around and asks people's and interns basically so I said like I'm good at editing I think and he says like can you really edit because most people say they can edit but they can't really edit it's like a storytelling aspects of it there's a lot into editing just not just pushing buttons and cutting clips and all that stuff so and he had asked me if I had any kind of demo reel, which I did um, when I applied to the internship. 
at AMS, they didn't ask me, but I just submitted my demo reel. But I created a DVD, I submitted it. So it was already ready, so I gave it to him. And one of the things that I did at while I was here was I created a documentary. And he saw that and he so, I guess, potential and he liked it so much that he gave me a, a project to do for him. And then which I did and he liked it and then which led it to the staff becoming a full-time staff and starting from the assistant editor and moving my way up to a senior editor now. So, I mean, it's really important to be ready and not just, you know, sit back and, okay, I'm just going to do, while you're interning, I'm just going to do whatever they tell me to do. It's just more proactive and just go above and beyond. And even though they're not paying you, it's just another opportunity to get another job and get more doors that are open that way. Wasn't the project, didn't he just throw you a book and say, make a, yeah. a I mean, that's just <laughs> like not a, a pro project. That's a big project. <laughs> So she had to read this book and then... Yeah, it was uh, basically he did an interview with... It was uh, um, like a pitch reel for a documentary. So it's a short promo for the documentary. And so he just gave me a, a transcript of his interview. And I had to create a story out of that and make it into like three-minute reel, basically promo for this documentary. So I had to like hunt for all these like archival footage and photos and music all by myself and like created a dis uh, graphics like at the end which now I look back it's really shady <laughs> anyway he liked it at the time so um yeah so I all I I, I just didn't really I, w I had like a producer who's really good at creating documentaries so I had a lot of input from him I would ask him questions a lot and you know he would Andy would check like all the way, like he would just watch like a minute of it and he'll give me feedback. So from there on, I was kind of like working pretty much by myself, but it was a good experience and it eventually led to a full staff job. That's great. So. And that's hard to get. A full staff job is hard to get. Yeah. Let's talk about a reel with David Koss. I remember David's reel, the piano. Was that your brother or was that you? Oh, I don't, that was I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> okay, but talk about your reel. I know it was good. Uh, my, my reel, actually, I just finished two new reels, one for myself and one for uh, my new company. And, you know, here's the thing about reels. Um, there are a lot of industries where you, where your college education is the most important thing that they look at on your resume. And it's a little bit different in this industry and I can't tell you how many times I've seen a reel come in someone's email inbox when we're looking for employees, uh, new employees. We'll put a Craigslist ad and we'll get an email and it has the resume attached at the bottom and it has a link to the demo reel. And the first thing everybody does is click on the demo reel. And if it does not impress within the first 10 seconds, it's, it's gone. They don't bother to look at it. They don't care about anything else that you have to say or anything else is attached. It's unfortunate. And I'm not saying that college education is, is not important. It is because that demo reel is kind of like the culmination of everything you've learned, your, the skills, the, um, the, the fundamentals, everything that you've done has come down to this. And that's why it's so important because you've spent years and years perfecting this craft and it's come down to a short reel that's going to impress within the first 10 seconds. And they don't have 10 minutes to watch mm -hmm. either. Right. Like, so put your best stuff at the beginning. Oh yeah. Okay. And a lot of people are using websites, right? Instead right. of just demo reels. They're using websites. Um, it depends on what you're doing. You know, if you're uh, a contractor, um, you probably want to have like a bunch of clips. Um, I guess you could have that either way, but um, on a website, it's nice to have that demo reel and you kind of have that, that powerful, I don't know if you want to call it a sizzle reel or not, but mm -hmm. just showing these little clips of all these cool things you've done. Um, but then if you want them to go see the other stuff, it's available on the site, but don't make them watch like everything that you've done in a demo reel because they're, they're going to they're gonna turn it off. Well, they won't, they won't watch it. Yeah. So. There was a study done actually and uh, they took a... They took a 30 second video and they put it on the internet and they had people watch it. Now, some of the people had a little bar, you know, a little bar that goes across at the bottom. 
some people had a bar that said it was one minute long. Some people had a bar that said it was 30 seconds long. And people that saw that it was a minute long were more likely to close it before it was over because one minute's too long. 30 seconds, I can handle that. And they would watch the whole thing, even though both of them were 30 seconds. So it's interesting. Great. We have a question over here. That was my question. How long is a demo reel? How long should it be? Well, a lot of people do say 30 seconds, but I think that it has to do with your content. You know, mm -hmm. if you're... If it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Motion graphics. If, if you're doing like a big motion graphics thing and you got some cool techno music, you know, something going on, um, if you've built it and structured it in the right way, you can keep people's attention longer. So it kind of just has to do with what your content is. Okay, this is a good question because we have intro st students here as well as senior level. So your question is? Yeah, um, I don't know what's a demo view because I, I don't come here. I go to Mountain View, but um, I'm here because this is like my dream, but I'm doing something else over there to get here. But I just don't know a lot of vocabulary when it comes to like video and technology. I just want to know what is a demo reel. What is that? Your reel, it depends on what you're doing in video, of course. Uh, but your reel is just going to be clips of projects that you've worked on to get to this point. So if you're in college and you're doing um, a bunch of, let's, let's say that you're doing motion graphics just because that's, that's what I do. Um, let's say that you work on 20 different motion graphics pieces and you do animations, 20 different animations. Um, you will probably end up with maybe 30 seconds of good footage from those 20. I just put a demo reel together and I had 170 different animations to pull from. Mm. And it was tough to choose. Shorten it down into one presentation that I can show people and say, look at all these little pieces of all these things I've done. And it doesn't have to be just stuff that you've done um, at school. It could be stuff that you've done for fun. I wouldn't do anything spec. Um, for example, I wouldn't animate a Coke logo and say, hey, I made a Coke logo. Mm -hmm. Because when, when people see that on your reel and they interview you, they're going to say, so what did you do for Coke? And you're going to be like, well, I didn't really do anything for Coke. I just kind of made that. But if it's, if it's something that you do for fun, you can say, I was, you know, this is an independent thing that I did. Or uh, if it's something that you did in school, uh, you could say, this is a piece I did for school. Um, but again, just take the best little pieces of everything and put them together in a short video. I think there's something to be said for having a specific demo reel too. Mm -hmm. Like you kind of have your overall one that might show a variety of skills or what you're best at, but if you're applying specifically for a documentary position or a news position to have like your best news package on reserve, to have your best sports reel on reserve, that way if you go for those different areas you can send something that's very dedicated to the position you're applying for. And I, I, Bill, I bet you've seen the other side of that equation as those pour into your inbox and stuff. Yeah, I, too. you know, like Tom was saying, and I think the others have touched on it too. I mean, there's two big things that really go into uh, in the video production kind of world that, that go into: Are you going to be successful, or are you going to, you know, find a good gig or not? And I think the demo reel is one of them. Um, you know, your college, your experience, and all of that. Uh, you you have to put together um, something that is hard hitting. Uh, fast paced, don't get emotionally attached to a particular project and put that first. I would test your demo reel on the people that you know. In other words, a lot of times you'll remember back at a particular production where you thought, oh my God, I remember that was just like a pain in the butt. That thing was hard to do and I'm going to put that up front because it was just so hard to overcome that. Uh, but when your audience sees that, they go, right? So what you really want are the things that are hard hitting fast. The other thing, do me a favor, I got some people that have pens and paper. Write this word down for me. Relationship. Okay? It's the biggest part of this business. Uh, video production uh, in general is a very small community. Am I right, Tom? Yeah. It's a small knit little community and you get to know everybody and you kind of like, I always like to say there's only 50, 50 people in, in video production and we just kind of keep changing jobs. <laughs> right? We're just kind of all around. So. Um, the relationships are very important uh, in building those long-term relationships to, uh, to move ahead is, is a big part. That's as important, I think, to me as a demo reel. I've never moved to a different job uh, based upon here's my res resume and here's my demo reel and I'm awesome. There's mm -hmm. always been a connection of relationship involved. 
Well, let's talk about what you did in college to prepare when you got out. Sure. Because you came to college from serving in the military, right? That's right, yes. I was an electronic spy in the military. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I got out uh, and decided that I wanted to do something technical, got into uh, the field here with Northlake, uh, and uh, learned a lot. But obviously, technolo technology changes very quickly in this business. Um, and so, I think what I tried to do to prepare for that, obviously, was what we talked about, the demo reels and those kinds of things. But I learned pretty quickly about that relationship piece that uh, I met a lady named Barbara Haley who worked in, uh, who was actually uh, an instructor here at North Lake, who also worked at the Radio Shack uh, complex downtown. Uh, and guess what? I ended up working with her as an intern and then later on being hired. So um, I think what I did was I tried to network some. Uh, I think you can kind of tell I'm not very shy. Did you, you can tell that? Yeah. So um, one of the things I, th I would recommend to you is don't be shy. When you uh, are in a production environment, go introduce yourself and start to build those relationships. Great. Oh, you have a question? Yeah, uh, uh, um, I want to say something. Uh, it's one thing that I noticed about uh, actors, editors, filmers, everybody. Um, this is serious to me because I go to Mountain View and I write scripts and notice that a lot of people are not really out there into like being, you know, into on on stage. Only have a few people, and I noticed that it's also about humble because you know because I, I remember being in a relationship, knowing the people, and um and knowing that the way they are, because I try to be humble, you know, over there, even though they have, because the actors, I'm not trying to say, that, you know, they were like a little odd, you know, yeah. to be honest. And it's like, you know, I'm trying my best to show, hey, this is what I could do, this is me, you know, let, you know like, let's work together and let's do this. And I want to know about humble. I want, like, I want you to talk about being humble because this is something, you know, a lot of people think that, uh, just because you're a better actor or just because you edit better than me or you this and that, you think you're better than me. And that's something I want to know, discuss about, you know, if you could discuss that with everybody else because this is something serious, you know, because you said about relationship. You know, everybody needs to know how to be a family. You understand what I'm saying? Because this is, this is a business, and, you know, and you really want to make, if you really want to make it out there like that, you got to be very, you got to be with each other, you know what I'm saying? So I want to know if you could just talk a little bit about relationship, like any issues that you have in the industry be before with other people. So if you could discuss that. Well, I think we could we definitely discuss that. Yeah, for sure. Who wants to? Well, I, I guess maybe to answer your question in terms of being humble, I mean, to me, I like to try to say that you should let your work speak for itself. Um, you know, that, that's, demo reel is part of that, obviously, but, but I think, um, you know, when you become involved with a production uh, or an organization, um, you know, as you're building those relationships and such, you know, I, I'm not one to really, I've never been kind of a touter of anything. I mean, to me, it's, I, I'd rather you look at my, my work and, and see where it goes from there. So, yeah, being humble, I think, is just a human nature part of who we, who we need to be, I think, to, uh, to, to grow in the industry, for sure. And more than that, I think, is attitude. Um, yeah. Tom knows more than that. I mean, there's a difference, I think, between being stuck up and being confident in your abilities. Mm -hmm. And I think people get those mixed up a lot, especially in this industry when you can get some position that feels so sexy and glamorous, but that contract ends in six months, mm -hmm. and you're back to printing scripts and doing stuff like that. I'm, I've said this every time I've ever come back to North Lake and spoke, is that the person that is coiling your cable today will be the person that's hiring you for your new position tomorrow, and you don't know that. Nobody's gonna stand around on a set. Like, I might freelance somewhere on the weekends and just be helping out, like, you know, parking cars for Fox or just doing something stupid, but they don't realize that the next weekend I need to hire 15 people for a production that I have going on. And I, it's not like I'm running around telling everybody that, I'm just watching, you know, who's good, whose attitude do I like? And the entire industry is full of that. People that, you know, one day are a production assistant for free, the next day they're associate producer on a reality television show that's gonna run for 14 weeks. And they're looking at you and you don't even realize that. So, I mean. It's that small world concept. Yeah, it, it's the I mean, same it really 50 is, people, yeah. yeah. There, there really are <laughs> only 50 people in the production yeah. business, you know, we just kind of mix, so absolutely, so be careful of who you're, who you're talking with, huh? Stand up. Uh, okay. Stand up, please. Thanks. Uh, is this a, a 
Okay. Uh, uh, so I have two questions. Uh, and first of all, my apologies to the gentleman who's had to deal with actors because uh, I used to do that. And, <laughs> you know, they can be a real terror. So, you know, um, thespians are what they are, and they can be some of the most self-indulgent people. But all that said, um, I have two questions. One for this gentleman uh, on the right, and then and then one for any and all of you. Uh, first of all, can you tell me what branch of service you were in without having me killed? And uh, uh, second of all, um, I was wondering, you know, speaking of actors, because um, I still have a lot of friends who are in that end of the business. Uh, you know, agents and casting. Certainly, I don't know about casting directors, but. but you know how electronic everything is now. All the the casting is done online. You know you get. It's no longer they call you. It's hey they shoot you an email. Check your email every two hours. Be here in three hours. Da 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 da. da. You know how all that runs. But they're demo reels. Um, I mean, last time I heard it was like up to two minutes for an actor's demo demo reel, and. Um, up to, I say, and in, in preferably shorter. Uh, but, you know, I, I kind of got the same ma message back in the day. It was like, look, you don't want this too long because it's, it's kind of like that same thing. You got about 10 seconds, maybe 15, to because some people understand that a scene has to develop, you know. But if they're not interested, click, and they're moving on to the next person that's in a, you know, this electronic line on a website, you know, these thumbnails, and we're going to click to their scene. I'm not at five seconds. I'm not interested in click at five seconds. I'm not interested. And then maybe, you know, and it's all about their headshot and their look. and the other. So I was wondering, uh, you know, maybe you had something to impart as far as advice uh, for your actors, because uh, I have friends that would probably be, you know, interested in hearing that, you know, as far as, you know, you know how long do they have in a demo reel? Anyway, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, let's go to Bill. <laughs> so, um, first of all, great shirt. He's got a Who shirt. I don't know if you, anybody can see that, but yeah, yeah, come on now. Bring it up. Uh, second of all, Army, hoo -ah. Okay. Um, third of all, 10 seconds. Um, when I have ever hired talent, um, I can tell probably within the first 10 seconds of seeing them in here, obviously video is a very big part of that. Go out to any of the sites, uh, any of the agencies, Suzanne Horner, you know, Kim Dawson, and I don't know about you guys, but for the most part, you know, you can tell within 10 seconds, hey, this person's got the right juice or the, you know, the right juju that I need for this particular spot. And it's usually so specific, too, when you're mm -hmm. casting talent. You're not judging them based on their ability right out of the gate. It's the headshot and the look, and you narrow down the field to such a small amount of people based off that. Those are the ones that are going to get more than 10 seconds. Now, every once in a while, you might be browsing through them just out of curiosity, and you might consider somebody for something just based on charisma that, okay, they're, this is not what we were looking for for the part, but damn, they're good. So we're going to go ahead and set this aside for maybe future purposes. But I think sometimes the demographic narrows you down small enough that from there you might take a longer look at something. Let's go into freelancing. And we'll start with Tom. And he'll talk about being out of town a lot. And I guess, David, you're here as well, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, I'd kind of like to refer back to what Grace said too about I think with freelance it's the opportunity like with what happened with Andy you don't ever see that coming yeah. you're, you're, you're never going <laughs> to really be prepared rare. for that time that somebody walks up to you and it's like hey let me see this or let's let's push you in this direction and see if you can make this work it's going to happen it's going to blindside you every single time so the best thing is to just have that little bit of professionalism and be prepared for it, whether it's a business card or a demo reel or to just always kind of be on your game when you're in a production environment because everybody's watching. You don't know who the person is that's going to give you the job, and that's the only way to get through those doors. I mean, they're, they're invisible, literally, and it's all based on relationships, and if you're kind of walking that line, I think that's the, the best thing for freelance. Um, I don't think people realize the lifestyle involved in it, like what it can do to family life or personal yeah. relationships or just Gosh. what time on the road is really like. So, um, it's not so glamorous. Yeah, and I know Dave has lived both sides of that coin 
you know, like yeah. it's sometimes it's really glamorous and other times you're like, man, I miss my own bed, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> simple stuff that you have to overcome to be able to, to do that. And also you have a family now, right? I have a family now, so I kind of transitioned off of the road and uh, mm -hmm. my wife, I met her while I was on the road and she had actually got to travel with me you know, at certain points doing merch and, and stuff like that for concerts. So that was nice and she was kind of used to it. But then we had a kid and then it's like, all right, well, I can't be on the road, you know, 40 weeks, 40 weekends out of the year. Um, there were some great, great things about it. You know, um, when you're traveling and you're doing contract work, generally the pay is better, right. you know, yeah. so it's kind of, yeah. you know, you've got to weigh that. But you might miss your baby's first step. <laughs> right, <laughs> so. that's the trade-off. I, I saw right. I saw my baby's first steps on Skype, <laughs> wow. oh, and that's no. when I knew yeah. that I had to do something different. Well, and right. where you're at in life too, I think, determines that chance of where should I try and steer where I'm going in this industry. If you're already established, you know, in your personal life, and you don't think you can be out there on the road, you might want to look at editing or something that's going to That's why I basically I chose to be an editor. But I see a lot of, like, we hire a lot of freelancers, and we, you know, send them out in, with producer, shooter, and audio guy, like, three-pack. And then they shoot, like, for example, for HGTV, we shoot, like, a segment of a house. Like, a, there's a great house, you know, by the beach, and then we shoot it, and we create a package out of that. So then what I want to say about freelancing is that because we hire producers as freelancers, like shooters are all, almost everyone are freelancers, audio guys, because we only have two audio guys in staff, so we can't, they can't be out all the time. So we hire all of them. But I get the other side where, you know, I'm with the producer and we hear feedback from, you know, our staff and our, you know, how they were out there and then their attitudes and, you know, how they were working, and I see their product. So what they've done and their audio qualities, and, and that's how we hire the same person the next time and for the next time. And most importantly, we had a lot of problems with the people with attitudes. And, you know, the production is hard, and it can run for like 12 hours, 13 hours, and not for us, but it's, it's usually like, you know, it could be longer than you expect and it's not eight hours always and it's not set time it's you just have to be there until you get your stuff done so but if there are people like grumbling and you know late and you know if they're not doing their job well and even if their you know product it's good if it's the relationship between you know the audio guy and the producer and how they can you know like if the producer wants more shots of that are they going to do it? Or they're just going to say, no, we've got it already. No, I'm not going to do it because we've just, I just shot it. But producer could be saying, you know, I just want a different angle. And then if the shooter gets it, then it's, you know, better. Um, it, gets, it puts a better imprint on the producer. And then eventually the producer will recommend that shooter and would want to go out with that shooter more. So how do you get paid? So we'll talk to Tom first. I, I think the first part of that equation is what do you charge, yeah. especially in freelancing, um, and that's a pretty delicate conversation. You, it's something that you don't just whip out on set, like if you're a production assistant for some camera operator, hey man, how much are you making today? Mm -hmm. like that's a loaded question, especially in the production environment when everybody could be at different rates based on their ability. So it's really something that you just have to wade through I mean when did you don't ask that question on set either. Do, yeah and, and like producer don't say that <laughs> exactly I mean what when was the first time you discovered like what an editor makes freelance how did you do that do you remember I, I don't even know it's just yeah. really it's just you you kind of start in the industry and you kind of build your way up and you you kind of know what you're making and you kind of have an idea of what everybody else is making and um, it's delicate, though. It is. And it's something that you sort of have to, um, I mean, not, not spy on, so to speak, but just be a sponge without being intrusive and just try and pick it up. You can do some research online, but even for camera operators, they might, in the corporate environment, they might be making 15 to 20 an hour. A uh, DP on a film set might be making 1,200 a day. So, I mean, even the ranges that you see are not applicable to your situation until you figure out what your situation is. But once you kind of have that down, 
Um, it, it works differently in all production environments. Some places have, even for freelancers, they have time cards when you come in and out, and they're keeping an eye on that. Other people expect you to totally handle that yourselves, and you're not going to get paid if you don't bill somebody. And that's what it comes down to. And on top of that, like, I have a lot of subcontractors now. I hate seeing an invoice come to me that is a Word document. And the first thing I do is open it, change it to zero, and send it back to them. Like, hey, man, you sent me a blank invoice. I just do it as a joke, but don't give somebody an invoice document that they can edit. I mean, that's just like bottom line, send over a PDF. Or use a, don't send me the same invoice with the same PO number on it for your first six jobs with me. And it all says invoice 001. It's like, come on, man. Like, that's pretty entry level <laughs> stuff that you see coming in a lot of the time. Um, and, there's and on top of that, I'm, I produce, and these guys have worked for me, and um, I want that invoice as soon as possible. One, I want to get you guys paid. One, I want to close the job. I don't yeah. want mm -hmm. it to remain open all the time. Yeah. So that just makes me even more mad if you wait a week or two and then you're complaining that you didn't get your check because we're not going to pay you until you give it to, to the producer and then it has to go through all these other avenues. And so. it could be 30 to 90 days is standard. I mean, really 30 days is standard for payment. Mm -hmm. And I get guys that come work for me sometimes and they're two days after the job like, hey man, when's my check going to get cut? And I'm like, not anytime soon, <laughs> you know, like, has, is it, you should be asking me that question at 25 days if you haven't seen it. And that's something that I, I didn't understand in the freelance world. I went out there and did a couple months worth of work and I was living on fumes, like eating ramen noodles, like I hope these checks come, <laughs> you know, it's just something that I completely didn't expect getting into the industry that that's how some of that worked. You don't get, you know, if you're not in a full-time position, you're not getting paid every two weeks, they're not taking taxes out of it you're completely handling all of the billing and receivables yourself. So let's talk about taxes because it's important. It's taxes. painful. It's it is. <laughs> well, um, in terms of taxes, um, there's this guy, I don't know if you've ever met him before, his name is Uncle Sam. <laughs> and uh, he tends to kind of want a chunk of what you do. And um, I made a mistake pretty early on when I first started freelancing, um, you know, I was making pretty good money and I you know worked quite a bit I was blessed to have you know that type of uh, uh, repeat I guess calls if you will but um, I heard that you were supposed to set 30 percent of your money back and I didn't you know and uh, come the end of the year uh, that big old check was uh, hard to write so yeah I, one of the things that I would do for you I mean two things um, set aside 30 to 35 percent of everything you make and to Tom's point, you might be still eating, you know, ramen noodles at this point. Uh, keep doing it uh, if that money's going to make a difference. The other thing is don't be married, I think, too, and I think you mentioned this. Don't be married to what you make. Um, you need experience. I mean, we all need experience. And so uh, you might make $1,200 a day on this gig, and you may make $200 a day on this gig, and then this gig is completely free, right? You're doing three days of nothing. Uh, so don't be married to that. It's not, don't tie that to your personal worth. It's not what you're worth. You're worth millions, aren't you? But, but just uh, be flexible with that so that you can get some experience under your belt. David, do you have anything? Well, I learned about taxes the hard way. You know, I uh, was getting a bunch of checks and doing contract work, so there were no taxes taken out. And when you're working for yourself, you're paying double Social Security. And uh, that, that was the problem, you know, it got to the end of the year and it was like, oh, I owe that much money, all right, well, let me write you an IOU for that. Um, and so that was kind of my learning experience in that and I had to pay that off for a while. But, um, you know, it's, it's something that, that now it seems like there, there's um, some great classes and stuff you can take on, on business. At the time, I really didn't have enough business knowledge and uh, so it was it was interesting but just keep an eye on that and and read about it on you know now you can go find a bunch of info on that online um, learn about if you want to be a sole proprietor or if you want to be a, an LLC or if you want to uh, form an S Corp or it's so let's there's talk a lot about of jobs because I know what most of us have done we went to the courthouse and we started our company for twelve dollars or fifteen dollars yeah. and then we're like good great I have my company so so I'm good but really what's yeah there's what's a the lot of differences there um, 
an LLC protects you a little bit legally but doesn't necessarily help your tax situation at all. Where I've learned recently you should be an LLC and then refile as an S corporation which is a sole proprietorship corporation and then you're setting yourself up to where you're an employee of yourself. You pay yourself, they only tax you on what you're making in the in the 30% range on your quote unquote salary and then the rest you can keep into the business and they don't tax you as high. You pay income taxes. Yeah. You won't be paying social security. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you're not getting hit up double or the the profit on your business that you planned on reinvesting into something else is not going through that same funnel. Um, and from a freelance standpoint too, I would always have a W-9 ready, filled out, is a digital document that you can just send over. And it looks really classy too if it's, you have it typed out and then signed at the bottom and it's not some handwritten chicken scratch, which mine was for the first few years, or I was filling it out on site every time. But now if I get a new freelance position, the first thing they're always going to ask you for is, we need a W-9 from you. So if you can just go, oh yeah, boom, and it's emailed right then, the producer will love you out of the gate, you know? <laughs> Like it's the little tiny things like that that will just knock down all kinds of doors for you guys. Like having your W-9 ready, showing up on set with some gloves if you're going to be handling cable, having a multi-tool with you, just a screwdriver and a knife. And mm -hmm. like those three things will put somebody at the top of my list over somebody else. And show up on time. Oh, oh yes. 15, <laughs> 15 minutes ahead of time is on time. Yeah, I okay, can't. so let's discuss that. I always tell my... Uh, business aspects class. Why you want to get there early is because sometimes we have to load a truck. If you're not there early, then your producer or director is having to load the truck, and we've paid our dues. We don't need to be loading trucks. So, mm -hmm. and that's really probably your purpose was being there. So, definitely get there early. He has a question about invoicing. Uh, my question is, uh, as you talk about doing freelance work and invoicing. What are your pros and cons about getting deposits as you go, you know, sometime you ask, people ask for a deposit, um, doing the invoice and, and including a, a certain amount of deposit before you get started on the job. Would you give me a little bit of information about that? Okay, and, and right now we're talking about you having your business getting a client, right? Not freelancing. I, I think part of that is how much you trust the client that you've landed. I know on a lot of big budget jobs or longer projects or especially a new relationship, production companies will ask for 20% up front. I've seen 50% up front, stuff like that. That's a little crazy, especially on a big budget job. Um, it's nice to have clients to where you don't feel like you have to do that. But at the same time, people get burned in this business all the time. And they do it to people that are clueless or a little green. They can see that and they're going to go, oh, we're going to use this guy for free for four days as a camera operator and never pay him ever. And I mean, I've, I have thousands and thousands of dollars that people owe me from years ago that I will never see because of situations like that. And it's just, I don't know that there's a good answer to that other than I wish people were good. But um, it does let people know you're serious. If you were to say, hey, this is a $10,000 job. I need 2000 up front before we ever even show up on set. But Things like that also come with contracts. They're not going to hand you over $2,000 without you signing something on your side that says, now that you paid me this, we're going to be there and there's no questions. And so that, that's really delicate too and that changes on a project by project basis. But I think it has a lot to do with trusting the people that you're going to be working with. But, but if I have a client, I want at least 20% up front that's because difficult. I'm going to have to feed my crew and, and yeah. all that expense. So. Well, and then from a producer standpoint, you front a lot of the bill. You know, like on jobs I go on, I'm paying rental cars, hotels, I'm paying my entire crew, everything. And I won't see that money back for 60 days. So, and that's the scary part of it too is when your own money is on the line in those situations. And you're not going to get that size contract if you can't do that. It's expected that if you're a production company, you're going to be able to foot those bills to then be reimbursed later on. Yeah, when it comes to relationships, um, if you get that money up front, you at least know that you can take care of the guys who are working for you. Because if somebody doesn't pay you and you didn't have a good contract with them, you didn't have anything worked out, you didn't have any money up front, and then you can't pay your guys, they're not going to want to come work for you again. Great. We have one more question. Um, 
speaking from a uh, producer's point of view or freelance producer, um, if you had a high budget project that you wanted to do but low capital, how would you approach uh, obtaining funds to make your project work? From the client or just from thin air? You just have have a project that you want to do. You know it's going to be high budget, but you have low capital in the bank, and you want to want to make that happen, make the project happen. Um, if it's a paying gig, the the thing you can do is just reach out to your client if it's a high enough budget and just be honest that, hey, we can handle this work, but we don't keep that type of capital around for situations like this. Like you can even lie about it, you know, a little white lie. Like we might have this type of capital, but you and I are new, so I'm not going to put this up front for you. And then from an independent standpoint, I mean, I've seen people just go crazy on Kickstarter and Indiegogo and make hundred thousand dollar short films happen in a matter of, matter of months by just crowdsourcing stuff. I mean, that's really become a big thing these days. Okay, let's talk about social media and how you should present yourself there. <laughs> yeah, I think our Facebook lives are not what they, what they would be. I mean, when you freelance, you have to, you're selling yourself and they will check for you everywhere. So, you, you know, I mean, even down to like what your email is, you can't be like sexykitten89 at hotmail.com. Like, <laughs> you just can't do that anymore. And I know a lot of people that have two different personas online. Like they might have, this is who, all, anyone associated with business, this is the account that they can friend. And then with my last name not associated and anything else like that, this is my personal account for like friends and family and that type of stuff and your digital footprint is huge. I mean, people will do research on you. And if you, if you have a company, you need to have a Facebook page, a website. Yeah. yeah, in this era, you have to promote yourself, especially in media. They're gonna, if that's what they're looking for you to do for them, you ought to be able to do that for yourself. Okay, so that means business cards? You even need those, okay. And don't get too hung up on what that card says. I think that was part of my problem for a while was, I don't like my company name, or I just switched jobs two or three times, or I've got a wide variety of talents. I don't know what to put on this business card. Just put your name, your phone number, your email. That's all it has to say, literally. You don't even have to put necessarily what you do. You could tell them that on site, you know, or discuss that with them. But as long as you can just hand over some contact information, I think that's the most pertinent aspect of that. Hi, uh, I have a question about when you have difficult clients that you're working with to present something, whether it be, you know, whatever industry you're in specifically, how do you go about resolving those issues? Uh, you know, any advice on difficult clients? Well, I've, I've had the same problem that, that you have, is, is there are clients going back who have owed me lots of money and I'm never going to see it. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about, I was hoping that, the, that contracts would come up. So I'll kind of relate it to that. Maybe having trouble getting paid. I don't know, you know, maybe that's the situation. Um, you have to have contract to protect yourself. And it can be something that you come up with and maybe have a lawyer look at or however you want to come up with a contract. There's, there's lots of resources online on how you can build a, a, a contract, an agreement, whatever you want to call it. But there are a lot of issues between you and your client that could get resolved because you have a contract. Um, and when you're putting together a contract, think of every excuse that they could possibly have to give you to not, to not pay you for some reason and put it in there. Um, acts of God. Um, you know, I mean, and all of this stuff that I write, my, my contracts are kind of a living document that keeps expanding constantly. Every time someone comes up with an excuse, I put something in my contracts so that that excuse cannot come up next time. Um, and you, you don't know. want to scare them away with the contract right. either. So it's, it, it can be. There's, there's, there, there will be conflicts between you and, and a client sometimes for one reason or another. Of course, you want them to be happy. You want, you want to resolve it. You want them to come back. Um, but if it's the type of issue uh, where 
they said that they told you to do one thing and, and you didn't. If you have it in writing, then Paper that's trail. all you need. It's right email, there. Email, save Emails. every email. Yeah. Copy anybody that's, you know. It's needed to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, is what, this is how much it's going to cost. This is when I'm going to bill you. This is when oh. um, you're going to pay me. This is how long you have. If you don't pay by this time, this is how much I'm going to charge extra. Everything you can possibly think of to put in there, especially when it comes down to writing specifically what you're going to do for that person and what your deliverables are and how you're going to deliver them and if, whether or not they have to pay by the time you're <coughs> um, done with the project. Um, that's, that's super important because you can always go back to that and say, here, look, you signed this thing right here. Dave, you know, one other quick thing that, that on a contract in Texas, we have this little thing called uh, whole contract acceptance. And basically what that means is that the entire contract uh, needs to be looked at. So in other words, let's say you build an incredible contract that's waterproof. And in the contract, you say, in order to start this production, I need 20% of the, of the money up front. Everybody signs, everybody's happy, and then when it comes down to it, they say, I only have 10%. You say, that's okay. Okay, you have just made that contract null and void. Okay, even though you're accepting it verbally, the 10% instead of the 20%. So everything else in that contract is null and void in front of a, a jury or in front of a judge mm -hmm. because you didn't, they didn't live up to their end of the bargain, so the contract is dead. Does that make sense? So be careful about those, that part of the contract. That's worth redrafting in that situation almost. Yeah. It is. And it getting is. it re-signed, yeah. I exactly. actually have a, a change order uh, paragraph mm -hmm. where it talks about if we make any changes whatsoever, we've got to completely redo this whole thing and sign it again and start over. Going back to that same kind of question, what about creative ideas that are being, maybe the client doesn't like or the client is kind of, you know, complaining about the creative aspects of the work? Mm. I would assume you guys deal with that. Yeah, we do a lot, but um, we try to find a medium. I mean, if, you know, a client can ask you ridiculous changes, you know, and if we don't agree, we try to explain them and take them through the whole, like, and sometimes talk them into it, basically. But if it's reasonable and it doesn't hurt, then we try to, like, satisfy a client more. And if, I mean, they obviously has, have their vision and since you know we're working for them and their vision actually we're trying to achieve what they're trying to you know do with their video so we try to accommodate what the clients you know wants and needs even though we don't agree sometimes but if it's like something that's really like you know if it's something that hurts the quality of the video then we would really talk to them and then try to make them understand that this way would be better if you do it this way. Because you have to take an ownership of being a professional. And clients, even though they think they know, they sometimes they don't know. And sometimes until they see it, they don't know. So even if they ask you to make some kind of a change and revisions, once they see it, it's like, oh, I think that the other way was better. So sometimes it's a better way to just do it and show it themselves and then have them figure out, oh yeah, this wasn't the good idea. Yeah, every marketing department head in the world, once you put them in an edit suite, mm -hmm. thinks that they're CC, you know, I mean, they're like a director at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, they <laughs> think they know everything yeah. and they think they are the professionals and they, you know, but it's not always the case and your job is to guide them to the right, right direction because you're the professional and you're the pro. So that's, you know, that's the way of approaching it, but not like offending the client because, you know, if you don't like, if you just be, take the ownership, no, it's my project and I'm just going to do it my way. That's, that doesn't work in this industry. Yeah. Having a clear sign off process works with that too. You know, if it's written into your contract, here's how many approvals we're going to go through. Right. You're going to sign off on this step yes. and this step and this step. Yeah, that, that actually really happens a lot. Like, so the cre creative, you know, with the, on paper of, all, um, and it goes to the production and then they sign off that production and the first rough cut edit and they sign off on that and then they make you know they give you a couple of revisions and then the fine cut and the master and there's like steps of you know the process that prevents from like getting it's, all the way yeah, to the end getting all the, the, end the way end. to the end and it goes like no this is not what I wanted and you know to prevent that so there's always the steps and one of the I'm just quick thing is 
have thick skin, okay? You know the rhino has one inch thick skin, right? You gotta have thick skin because you invest yourself into this project and you really put a lot of creativity and a lot of yourself in it. And then somebody comes along and goes, oh God, really? <laughs> That's what you did for me? And it hurts a little bit, right? And in the beginning, you'll be like, well, yeah, what's your problem? I mean, right. obviously you don't have the <laughs> eyes, right? What's, what's your deal, right? So um, have thick skin. Uh, people are gonna take the projects that you've poured your creativity into and they're not gonna like them. Just get ready for that. Yeah. Yes, so I was wanting to continue on with that. You know, so you have the stages, you have the rough cut, mm -hmm. the, um, the and intermediate area stages, and then your final project pitch that you show to your marketing people. And um, I was wondering time management. How do you determine how long to put into the rough cut? You know, how many hours, billable hours do you mm. put into it before it's good enough to move on to, the, to show and move on to the next point and the next point? I guess it all depends on the project and size of it. Yeah, the timeline. Like yeah, the timeline. When, if it, when is that final deliverable right. due and when did your footage come back right. from the field? You know, it's kind of like mm -hmm. that's your initial time frame. Right. So they usually we build calendar up front before we even go into the production. So we kind of estimate when the first rough cut will be due and for the next cut would be due in the, the final delivery. And they always have their deadlines, the networks, or whoever the client is. So we kind of work backwards and then start. If you have to start from, you know, like two months before the final delivery, then, I mean, you have to hire more people to meet that deadline, obviously, because you can't just do it all by yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah well, just, uh, trying to find out, especially with uh, realizing like short films, um, you know, you normally hire actors and stuff like that. What is your obligation vis-a-vis -vis the actor and the government, especially with taxes? What are those taxes that actually you must pay to the government? Maybe you want to use a park, a recreational center, only limit uh, casualty or unforeseen when you don't do those things. You're really putting yourself on the line to run <laughs> productions, especially with safety and stuff like that. I'm sure you deal with that a little more, Bill, with talent and things like that, potentially, than I have to. I, I mean, I, we deal with talent from time to time, but lately, obviously, in our little world, we, um, we don't deal with talent as much. But in my past year's experience, um, you're going to find, and I think it's a balance to answer your question. It's like, look, I've got this much of the pie, and I've got this much money to be saved and where am I going to end up using that to protect myself. Um, when it comes to insurance, uh, you're always better off putting kind of that money into safety, if you will. You know, it's little things like when the cables are across the floor, are they taped down? Yeah. You know, those little things that somebody trips, well, if you've at least got them taped down, you've at least put in some sort of kind of measure to help make sure that safety's there. I think that will protect you as well. And don't, don't assume anything because if your actors are on set and they assume that they're covered but you know darn well that they're not, that just needs to be clarified, especially on a short film. It's like, hey, this is a short film. We have no budget. We're all doing this for the love of it. Let's sign off on that. Mm -hmm. If you fall, mm -hmm. you fell. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't trip you. You fell. You know, and then there's, there's a lot of, and I just discovered this recently, there's a lot of corporations out there, insurance agencies, that will, you don't have to have a year-long policy with them. I call all the time just for a couple specific shoots we do every year and get those two days insured for all of my people and all of the gear, but I mean literally from just 48 hours. And that's all I'm paying for the policy. And it's a one-off, they shoot it over to me, everybody signs off on it, and I know I'm good for 48 hours. Because the rest of the year I might not have 20 people on site and all this jibs and all that type of stuff but for that small time frame I need to be covered right. so definitely look at at small per project insurance policies as a good solution to that that's yeah that's like obligations towards the state maybe uh, how much do you have to pay to use that because they see you out there filming uh maybe police can come and stop your oh your yeah shirt. you definitely have to have permits and all that i mean get your ducks in a row you can't just show up somewhere especially on s 
government property or city property and expect to just do whatever you need to do. But you have to clear those with the municipalities that you're working with. If you're doing it at a parks and recreation center, you need to contact that department and clear it with them and make sure you have a permit and that everything's good. It, one other quick thing is don't bite off more than you can chew, right? So if you got this big thing that's happening and you're in the park and you got all these people, all the actors, and if you can't afford to make it work, then maybe you need a smaller chunk, a smaller bite, a smaller production. For someone that's starting their own business, as far as like you all, um, what would be your best advice for us as far as going out and trying to get a contract or a marketing, your, mar your marketing process? Relationships. Word of mouth. <laughs> hit, hit, um, hit all the, the stuff in town. Join the DPA. Go to the DPA meetings. I mean, that's the one thing I can say about Dallas that's an amazing resource. Um, DPA is Dallas Producers Association and they're they're very open arms even if you're not a member you can show up to their events you might have to pay ten dollars to get in but just rub elbows work for free just go out there on productions put yourself in situations that you might not have typically to meet as many people as you possibly can and then just always be prepared for that door that's going to open or that curveball that you're not expecting and before you know it those jobs will just start coming your way Okay, let's talk a little bit about associations. You mentioned DPA. Um, I think unions too mm -hmm. are, are under that umbrella of just things that you should be aware of. Um, what do we have in Texas? We have the IATSE is a big union here that is in electrical and as if you're ever gonna work a sports truck, the majority of the guys are part of some kind of union. Texas is a right to work state though. You don't have to be in a union. But if you plan on freelancing in LA or California, uh, New York, anywhere on the East Coast, for sure, you have to look into unions. Um, I'm not a big fan of them because a lot of times it's based on seniority and not on actual talent. So that's just my personal opinion. But I agree. yeah, um, not a not a fan of unions. But there's you know SAG, which is the Studio mm -hmm. Actors Screen, Actor, Screen Actors Guild, um, which unions do protect people though from being treated wrongly mm -hmm. True. To, to being on a set for 14 hours and you rest for five hours and then you're back on set and, exactly you know where you're able to sleep so they protect you a little bit they take care of you in that sense I think a lot of freelancers have they have their own stipulations based on that now like if you're gonna give me a five-hour turnaround you better expect that when I come in the next day I'm already in time and a half because I didn't have eight hours off the clock and a lot of freelancers in Texas have their own, whether it's written into the contracts that they have signed or something like that, that protects them from that. But my experience with the union has just been like it works more to the other half of that equation that I see a lot of people on set that maybe shouldn't be there <laughs> and things of that nature just because the union is protecting them in that sense. Um, what other and, associations? And there's other organizations. Women in Film Dallas is a great one. Yep. Um, they accept men as well. Um, there's a lot of scholarships available. Um, there's Dallas Screenwriters Association, which they meet every month. And so you just have to Google these organizations. And it's part of developing those relationships. Like those are good places to go in on the ground level and just start shaking hands. Okay, we have a question back here. Uh, yeah, so I am really new to this world, but I think I, I, what I know of it so far, I love it, and I, but I have no idea where to start, to get experience, to get more knowledge of, you know, I'm taking a class, but more than that, just getting experience. Where do you recommend people go if they don't know what part of this industry they would want to be, um, go towards? How would they get experience in all aspects and then learn where to kind of focus themselves? Where is there a sign up that you can go to and say, hey, I'll work for free just to get some experience or, you know, what kind of, I don't know how to end the question, but what kind of um, um, resources are there out there for like that? You know, I, I think that goes back to like relationships. I think we talked a lot about that, didn't we, Tom and David and Grace? Oh, we talked a lot about um, you know, build some of the, start to do some of the things that I think they've all kind of mentioned, which is go out and start shaking some hands and getting involved. Uh, and then I think that is, I don't, I don't know of any, unless you guys do, a place where you could just go, hey, I'm, 
got a little bit of experience with this. Sign me up. I'll, I'll be a freebie for today. Just want to learn. Um, but I think that just comes through the relationship side. And so to your point, you're not sure if you want to be post-production or if you want to be shooting or if you want to be producing or what you want to do just yet. So uh, the free uh, volunteer kind of thing is good. The only way to get there, as far as I know, is to really network relationships. Yeah. I think I got lucky early on with some help from Andy and June and stuff to get in at Irving Community Television Network and they they had all aspects. They had a corporate division, a sports division, an arts division, they had post and field and so to have a taste of all of that really let me know this is where I think I might be best and what I need to do. Like for a while I wanted to be an editor. I was getting a lot of work as an editor and I absolutely hated it. I mean, like I could not just sit there in front of the machine all day long and I, when did you decide you were more post than field? I mean, what yeah. were the... Uh, you know what, when, when I got into motion graphics and I realized that after I was done working for the day, I was going home and I was doing it for fun. You know, when I, when I realized um, that I wasn't just working to live, I was living to do that work, I knew I was exactly in the right spot. And you may hop around, I mean, I started, um, I started out, you know, doing shooting. And I realized, well, I get it and I'm having fun, but you know, maybe I'll try editing. And then I did editing and I'm decent at editing, but it just, again, it was, I don't go home and edit at night because, you know, just for fun. But when I got the graphics and I realized, okay, I could just do this all day long. I can sit in this chair for 18 hours and not realize what time it is. Kind of knew I was in that spot. Uh, <clears throat> Would you say it's better to specialize in just one aspect of production or be more broad-minded and uh, get, know a little of everything? Later on in your career to get your rate or your pay to where you would like it to be, it's definitely good to specialize and be somebody that's really good at this specific thing. The problem is you're not going to be good at that specific thing unless you understand the other parts coming around it. Like somebody told me one time, the best shooters are good editors. Oh, yeah. The best editors know how to shoot, and that's just, it's a very loaded question in that sense. Well, hey guys, I wanted to know uh, if y'all can give me a or give all of us a brief insight of each one of y'all's company and just let us know a little uh, about what y'all specialize in. Our company actually has three divisions. Um, it has a corporate side and has an original programming, which is you know um, TVs and networks and all sorts, and we have like a government which is in Austin. So they do a lot of work for the government and just you know, promoting like campaigns and stuff. And then the CS side, it would be just all corporate messaging and corporate side, more like an agency, marketing agency now, than it was before. So they just, from the creative to how to market, you know, like Dallas Zoo and um, the, what is it, Dart. They're at that, those are the two, like an HP, like PepsiCo and Frito-Lay. Like, you know, just um, creating corporate video is their main thing. And do the infomercials, too. Um, and I'm under OP um, programming, which, you know, we make like an hour long series and specials and pilots. And we've done like reality TV shows, like um, that was called Girl Meets Gal. And then we did like a bike show and, you know, follow through the, all these like bike rallies and which was called like a Cops and Bikers. I think it's now badass bikers or something like that. <laughs> and we have like a Car Sharks, which is like another reality TV show um, that's, you know, like different garages and their conversion from like old car to the, you know, and then they sell it. And that's like a 30 minute show. And we have like a home category, which is, you know, I don't know if you and you guys watch HGTV, but it's like, you know, like all these amazing homes and we kind of magazine type of shows, like hour long. And like a pools and like bathrooms and all these home great homes and million dollar homes and all of those and we've done a lot of that um, over the past couple of years. It's just kind of like flour flourished from the last year and year and two. So I've done a lot of like finishing and editing and um, meeting the network guidelines and you know like delivering the shows to the network. And which just, I think it's one of the show special, it aired this morning and on HGTV, which I'll never get to see because I don't have cable, but. <laughs> 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 but I don't. Uh, Tom, Tom 
Tom, you had some experience with hot on homes. Yeah, and that was that was interesting. That was a um, it was like the entertainment tonight of the new home market <laughs> before the real estate industry just took a giant dive, and that was probably one of my early um, successes. I was with the Cowboys for a year when they tried to do their version of the NFL network before it got shut down. And then I moved to Hot on Homes and produced their, I opened their Oklahoma City show and then I started producing their Austin and San Antonio shows. Mm -hmm. And then the real estate market took a dive and after that I just started my own business. Um, just got lucky with a few relationships that I had established and it turned into a huge market now for online video and things like that. So we focus in live streaming, Personally, I shoot a lot. Um, I don't do so much editing anymore, but more and more it's me just running the business. I have a lot of subcontractors. I hire a lot of shooters and a lot of editors. I staff stuff. We do um, digital delivery of media. So, you know, what happens to the project after it's shot? Where is the server? How, does, how do you stream something on your phone? I mean, we're handling it from front end all the way to back end. And I think one thing, like touching on what Grace said, coming out of North Lake, I didn't realize the corporate video market that was out there is mm -hmm. huge. It's huge. And I think we kind of focus on the stuff that we consume yeah. when we're younger, like, oh, this must be what the industry is. Well, there's entire hidden industries out there that you don't see. Videos and you'll we'll never see. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, I think the description of what I do kind of touches on a couple of these questions um, about finding your niche um, because I wasn't planning on going down the path that I went down and I just kind of fell into that category but um, doing motion graphics I do a lot of stuff for um, corporate videos I do stuff for commercials I do stuff um, for edits it's nice to have that editing background it's nice to have the shooting background um, what what we're doing with a lot of graphics is we're creating things for corporate shows. We're creating a lot of things for um, tours and stuff like that. Um, what was nice is to have a little bit of a background in that area, doing um, live directing, doing video stuff on the road. And, you know, if you were to try and look for somebody online who, who had the concert experience and knew stuff about switchers and about doing stuff live and about media servers but was also a graphic designer be hard to find that person and uh, I'm trying to find those people who are looking for that um, so that kind of brings some of those questions together about finding your place you'll just kind of you kind of get there and you look back and it will be very clear how you got there yeah but you, you know never imagine falling <laughs> right. into that yeah and um, so and so that's what we're doing now. We're doing, we're trying to focus now because we're in that point where we're trying to become specialists at these specific things. If you have a, an LED wall at a concert and it's divided into um, five different weird geometric shapes, how do you go about building graphics that fit on all those LED walls the right way? Um, so that's what I do. I don't know. <laughs> So um, obviously, Dillard's Department Stores, I hope you all shop there. I think I recognize that shirt that you have on right there. We sell that on our men's department. So we, uh, we, have, um, we have roughly 300 stores in 29 states. They range anywhere from 750,000 square feet to you know, 1.5 million square feet. And um, um, it's kind of like what you guys were talking about. You know, not, not all video is what we consumed when we were younger and we thought, oh, that's so cool. I can't wait to produce that. What we do a lot is the, the corporate side, obviously. So um, the year before last, we did 1,000 videos. This year, we did about 800 videos that we put. Mm -hmm. uh, we developed um, companies a lot of times don't know what they want or what they need until you show them. And prior to our little team, uh, we didn't have a real good way of training and so we developed this little thing that we call DTube which is like YouTube but it allows us to video delivery out to the POS uh, the point of sales in the store so the cool thing about this is that we have you know anywhere from you know 75 to 150 POS stations already in the stores we built a content server at each of the stores 
we serve the videos to them directly. And so when they watch the video, there's no latency. So what we did was we said, look, there's 50,000 associates out here in Dillard's. Look at this audience. How do we train them? You can't train them using footsteps uh, with four people or 10 people or 100 people. So we kind of developed this little thing. So one of the things I would just kind of encourage you to understand is it's not all sexy, right? You know? So and usually the sexy stuff pays the least. Yeah, right. Yeah. They base it on that fact, like, oh, this is a glamorous job. We can undercut them. Yeah. But the boring stuff will pay the most. I mean, it's a weird dichotomy there. Mm -hmm. I have two questions in part. Uh, one is how important is a proposal? And the second part goes back to the demo reel. What are we supposed to keep with us? Uh, this one young man told me about a portable hard drive. What about a portable DVD player? A or? YouTube link. That's, any of yeah. that would be so, definitely not DVD at all. Like, they at this point. Can. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if somebody mailed me a DVD, I would be like, okay, you, you're not with the industry right now. I would say a YouTube link, period. You can pull it up on your phone, your iPad, any device you have. Just have it saved in a spot that you can copy it, paste it, and text it to somebody or email it to somebody. And what about the proposal? How to build them or? Uh, how important are they when you're trying to get business and? I, I think it, actually it comes back to the relationship aspect. Somebody that wants to work with you is going to want to work with you. They're going to want to know pricing and estimates and things like that. But sometimes it's just as much as giving them a ballpark number um, to be able to de develop a proposal and communicate that clearly is, is important, but I wouldn't stress about that too much because at the end of the day, I don't think it's, that's going to be what wins or loses it for you. Relationship, I would like to know you recommend for me the resource or any information to build a re relationship around the life of area or in America. Associations. Uh, you know, associations or how to build the relationship, is that what uh, you Yeah, you, you, you know, know. you say the relationship is very important. Yes. So I need to know the information like resource, website, group, or or any association to build relationship. Right. Even they have to pay money or it's free to, to build. I think it kind of starts here. Like right now with the people you're sitting next to in this room. I mean, that's, that's what happened with Dave and I, you know? <laughs> like I almost went out on a George Strait tour with him and had to back out at the last second but was able to fill it with another relationship that I trusted and I knew I wasn't going to leave <coughs> Dave hanging. So I mean, some of the stuff just starts right here where you're sitting today, honestly. And now that guy that you introduced me to is one of my best friends, so it's, it's <laughs> funny how that all, all yeah. comes together. And of course, he knew a bunch of people that I knew already, and again, small world. Yeah, and I mean, three weeks ago I called Dave because I needed a camera operator in Nashville. Just like, it's all relationships. I don't know if... You know, and I would not underestimate, okay, look, you got demo reel, you got websites, you've got um, DPA, you got all these great resources, but I would not underestimate this right here. Because at the end of the day, what builds a relationship is my face in front of your face, right? It's, it's about, um, you can be a part of the DPA, but if you don't go to the events, if you don't, if you got to put some feet on the ground, and to your point, Tom, I mean, it starts here and it just never stops. You've got to put your face in front of others. Yeah. Hey, how y'all doing? Uh, what advice will y'all give an amateur music producer to maybe uh, build his skills or what certain skills is important out in the industry and what uh, piece of equipment would y'all advise a music producer to buy to up his game? Good laptop out of the gate, I think everybody should have um, and maybe a, a knowledge of different operating systems too. try not to tie yourself too much to OSX or too much to Windows be able to kind of be a cross-platform guy is, is always good um, but mainly but mainly Mac mainly Mac. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. um, and to understand the the environment you're taking like are you trying to build music for production or are you trying to build just music for people and yeah. um, having all different types of music 
producer. I mean, you could be a sound design and yeah. um, everything, music, composing, and or maybe just a producer that oversees everything. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe something, some sort of good in input output device um, to bring signals into your workstation, whether that's XLR or quarter inch or RCA yeah. or whatever. Just have some kind of good I/O panel and back up your data. Oh, yeah. Like know your digital footprint time machine your system, don't ever say, oh, I lost your project, or oh, my computer <laughs> crashed. That, that is not an excuse. My computer crashed, I'd go buy one in an hour and have it back up and running in two. Like, that's the world we live in. You can't, oh, I got my stuff on a hard drive. Okay, where's the second one? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But don't concentrate, so, don't concentrate too much on the gear. Concentrate more on the art. Yeah, you need to have, you know, good enough gear so where you're not producing music, like with a, 60 cycle hum in it, but um, don't get so caught up in what kind of gear you're using that you forget about the art. Make sure that, I mean, because if, if you're really good at your art, you can, you can make music on anything. Right. Um, all right, hello and good afternoon. Um, thank you guys for coming out and uh, sharing some time with us this afternoon. We certainly appreciate it. Just wonder if you could speak, um, any of you could speak on maybe kind of what's going on in the industry in the future, like things that we can't see from our vantage point that you guys maybe can see now. Where, what's going on in terms of emerging technologies and more importantly, maybe even emerging markets that we need to be in tune with that we maybe can't see from this point? Thank you. I think cable is dying. Like even what Bill said in their corporate structure, he's not shipping tapes to stores. He's delivering a video to a server that lives in house and they're calling it right there. Um, it's all digital. Digital all media. Digital Everything media. shots digitally. There's no tape stocks or yeah. tape library anymore. And even tape libraries Servers. that do exist, we're currently digitizing that media and transferring it to, you know, yeah. safe storage on servers and backing it up because beta tapes are dying by the thousands on people's shelves right now. Mm. Um, I mean, just look at the way you guys consume media. Netflix, Amazon Prime, like when they released House of Cards, they dropped it as a series at one time and you could watch the whole thing. I know that DirecTV and Time Warner are talking to Roku right now about making all of their services available on that. Like traditional television as it's known is dying. The, the traditional commercial market is dying. And it's more about these companies directly getting the money from the consumer. You know, eight bucks a month for Netflix and then they're negotiating with HBO. Stuff like that. That's a great question. And also, I think gaming, I think that's a new up-and-coming thing to embrace, creating music for games and all that. Okay, we're wrapping this up. So one sentence of advice for these students, and then we'll wrap. Okay. I would say that you need to be patient but persistent. Great. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I agree. You, you kind of, you kind of <laughs> took the words out of my mouth. I agree with that. Um, you, you never know. You just never know where the next job is coming from. Relationships, relationships, relationships. For me, everything started here. So. That's great. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. And for you guys, just keep creating. Thank you. That's a wrap. Thank you, everybody. It's pretty good, I guess.